a firefly sting. That's what they called the birthmark on your arm when you were a child. But occasionally, it would flare up, producing its own light, and you saw the worried looks it got. Its bizarrely regular shape would gleam on your skin like a torch. You'd never met anyone else with one. You'd never even heard about anyone else with one. The land of your birth was filled with legends. The library expedition, the 12 adventurers who'd found the birthplace of the world, the resulting exodus from Auroria, the northern continent, the settling of what is now Nuya. But in all the legends, there was no mention of anyone with a gold rune-like mark on their arm was a perfect anomaly. When Marion caused the golden mark to flare on your arm, your muscles trembled. Memories flashed dizzyingly before your eyes. It was easy to assume they were your own life, but you soon saw grand cities unlike anything on New Year. It was as though you were looking out through someone else's eyes. As that person purchased fish in a marketplace, a mirror in a nearby booth reflected her face. A chestnut-haired young woman with milky skin and the refined features of a noble. The memory vanished as quickly as it had begun, leaving you unsteady. You wondered if Marion had caused you to see it, but she betrayed no knowledge of it. You'd always heard that when they died during the destruction of Auroria, the members of the library expedition passed their memories to the survivors of their races. Although time had faded those memories, some especially skilled individuals could recall them. Because the Aurorans passed through the hereafter on the way to safety during the exodus, It was said that the goddess Nui's memories could be felt especially strongly. Before the journey had transformed her to the goddess Nui. She had been a charity-minded noblewoman named Diana. Your golden mark burned. Another memory appeared. A charming hooded vagrant begging for food. The more Marion spoke of Lucius, which she did often, crediting him with the carnage you saw, the more memories seemed to fill your head. It was clear they were Rihanna's. She apparently used her family's wealth to run a soup kitchen for the city's poor. You saw the smiling vagrant begging for food from the soup kitchen every day and her Diana eventually chastise him for being able-bodied, but relying on charity. With a laugh, he handed her two tickets to a play in a local theater. As more memories flashed, you shared Diana's realization that this man was Lucius Quinto, a famous playwright. Could this be Marion's Lucius? What kind of playwright could commit such carnage? especially one who seems so charming. The blood hands had been a frequent topic of conversation in Souls Reap for years. They were known as a secretive association of assassins with dealings at all levels of society. The group's motives were shrouded in mystery but rumors spoke of religious fanaticism and a plot to rule the Crescent Throne. Blamed for a spate of kidnappings, they became the region's boogeymen. A reason for children to fear the dark and for parents to secure their homes at nightfall. Of course, these everyday phobias belied the true horror of the organization. 
they had allegedly assassinated the last king and had grown very dangerous and powerful. You wondered if they'd had any historical precedent in Iana's time. However, her memories held no mention of these dark assassins or their trademark crimson gloves. When you visited the stern-looking general, your rune burned with new memories. You saw guards in similar armor posted around Iana's house. As she shyly showed Lucius the home, half apologizing for its extravagance. The guards glared suspiciously. Though a well-received playwright, Lucius was still a commoner. In another memory, her father sternly reminded her that she was expected to marry within her rank. Yet another, Iana and Lucius agreed to meet again in secret. She said she knew that being famous, he was surrounded by many women and might not want the hassle of dating a noble's daughter. But just in case, she'd bought a ring to symbolize their love. Lucius put it on and kissed her. As you interrogated the blood hand, more memories pressed in on you. You'd held them back until you'd finished with the man, then stumbled under their emotion. You saw another interrogation, except this one took place at a trial before a mob of thousands. Lucius stood chained on a platform. It was his fate the trial was meant to decide. He'd written something controversial, something bordering on heresy. Some in the mob were screaming for his head. You swallowed, vividly recalling the lump of worry in Iana's throat as the verdict neared. Before it was read, the memory faded, and with it, the rune's glowing sensation. You couldn't understand what Iana's memories had to do with your birthmark. But it burned every time you experienced one. The Ring of Nui. You'd never heard of such an artifact, but couldn't help but remember the ring Iana had given Lucius as a symbol of their love. True, that was long before they'd received the powers they were known for. But it was Iana who'd received the powers of Nui and become the goddess during the expedition. Perhaps when they'd entered the mythical garden, the birthplace of the world. The ordinary ring she'd given Lucius had been imbued with power, just like she was. You searched for what you'd seen of her memories, and a fortress-like prison filled your mind. Had Lucius been convicted? Oddly enough, Iana turned, and you saw Lucius standing at her side. Sloane's home was sparse and compact. Clearly, he had no family. However, the note from the ring box hinted that he did have someone special. When you touched the cushion inside, you got the vivid sensation it had held the ring of Nui. And that it was, indeed, the ring Iana had given to Lucius. How many love stories had that humble circle played a role in? First, Iana and Lucius. Then Sloan and his mystery love. Certainly, the Blood Hands had no such romantic intentions for it. You combed Iana's memories, but again saw no reference to the Blood Hands. There was no hint at why the ring would be valuable to anyone but lovers either. And not a clue as to what powers it may have received. The Castigant ruins were a frequent and popular subject for any bard with his salt. Many bards had recast the story as a morality tale 
about respecting one's betters. But the best version simply presented the story as it was, without extraneous embellishment. Though the Crescent Throne was weaker now, its power had once been vast. A noble had declared himself to be a rival king and built a grand castle to legitimize himself. After a series of intrigues, during which he claimed vast swaths of land and raised taxes, his forces were easily crushed by the Crescent Throne proper. The notoriously bloody battle had turned the soil to crimson mud. Hoping to prevent future uprisings, the Crescent Throne had wanted to set an example. It was no wonder some spirits would be tortured enough to keep wandering. As Malcolm fell, a golden rune flamed on his arm. It looked exactly like your own. You started to ask him about it, but his last breath rasped from his lips, and he grew still. You seized Diana's memories. They must contain some kind of clue. However, their connection to the rune was as inscrutable as ever. What you did see was another member of the expedition take credit for Lucius's play. A selfish act had exonerated Lucius at the cost of his friend's freedom. Shocked to receive such a gift, even from a friend, Yana grew passionate about saving him. Here, you realized the history books had it wrong. Though the adventurers had wanted to find the birthplace of the world and the source of magic, the real catalyst for their adventure was a prison break. After helping their honorable friend escape prison, they'd had to flee the city. If Yana's memories had shown you anything of use, it was that history could be rewritten and shouldn't necessarily be trusted. All accounts painted Sloane as a normal, retired soldier he had somehow come into a possession of the Ring of Nui, a powerful artifact. There was clearly more to his story than you'd uncovered so far. Even Malcolm was more than he seemed. He'd raved about a war, but peace had reigned for centuries. He might have gone mad, or he might have known something that you didn't. And how had he ended up with your same birthmark? Did it mean he recalled Iana's memories too? Perhaps he could have explained everything. As it stood, even his foster mother knew nothing of his origins or the birthmark you shared. For once, instead of a stranger's memories, your mind was clouded only with questions. Malcolm had told Emma he joined an elite religious group, but which one? The area was certainly ripe with Dahuta cultists. Could they be related to this Maya as well? Legends said that before she became the goddess, Dahuta had been an ordinary elf. And, like Iana and Lucius, a member of the library expedition you glimpsed a stunning elf in the background of Iana's memories. It was probably Dahuta. When she'd entered the garden, the birthplace of the world, she'd become the goddess of change. Just as Iana had become Nui, goddess of the hereafter. Though most Nuyans worship Nui, their namesake, perhaps Malcolm had been hoping for a change. Malcolm's empty grave yawned up at the sky. It seemed an oddly appropriate setting for you. Since you couldn't seem to escape the memories of the goddess of the hereafter, 
though she'd left you countless happy musings of lazy afternoons in Lucius's arms. She also shared her pain. While given a god's abilities and duties, she'd been left with her human sympathies and emotions. As it turned out, most creatures did not die in peace. They left the world kicking and screaming, torn by great regret and protest. Sometimes, spirits had to be literally dragged out of mangled corpses. Iana had such empathy that she had devoted her human life to helping the needy. As a goddess, every unhappy soul she guided to the hereafter had rent her heart to pieces. It had always been clear that Merian came from wealth and breeding. But seeing her guards, it struck you that she might not only be rich, but noble. Long ago, the ruling queen was an elegant woman named Merian. She was forever memorialized in the name of the city of Merianople. Three powerful families still ruled the city, vying for power between them. Each named their daughters Marion, in the hopes of fating her to be the next queen. And of course, fating her family to ride her coattails to new heights of prominence and wealth. Naturally, many commoners secretly named their daughters Marion for the same reason. But commoners didn't typically have cadres of loyal guards. The Merian who'd found you could be of noble blood, a powerful ally indeed. Merian tended to babble because so much of life reminded her of history. The pet topic was Lucius. The more she spoke of him, the surer you became she was indeed Iana's Lucius. Merian was one of the most educated people you'd met. Only the very rich could afford to spend so much time learning instead of earning a living. When you asked how Merian knew so much about Lucius, she showed a prized possession. A tattered, well-loved volume called Gods and Heroes. You were familiar with the title. It was the story of the expedition. If only Marion knew how familiar you were getting with that story already. Not to mention that you were hearing it straight from the source. You'd heard the Nui's Chosen mentioned several times. Marion finally explained what they were. They were apparently warriors who lived in the hereafter. Guarding the hereafter gate from attacks by the Crimson Army. The army that had once been led by the God of Destruction during the war on Aurora. They were now under the command of the Dread God's top advisor and general, Antholon. Mostly consisting of undead, they wanted nothing more than to shatter through the Hereafter Gate and overtake Nuya the way they'd once overtaken Aurora, completing their conquest of the world. As to exactly who the Nui's chosen were, or why they'd been chosen, Marion had no clue. Iana's memories were equally unenlightening. Perhaps White Arden held the answers. Though their faces looked young, the eyes of the Nui's Chosen appeared haunted, as if they'd seen far too much. For his part, Alexander looked like a boy of no more than twenty. It seemed impossible he'd been one of Sloane's closest friends. Sloane had been at least three times Alexander's age, if not more. At any rate, he'd been able to explain exactly why the Ring of Nui was powerful. Sealing souls in the hereafter, conjuring souls back. Fitting for the goddess of death's ring. Though based on her memories, Iana had a kind heart. While she'd have gladly helped Flora, you doubted she'd approve of necromancy. 
especially if it was committed using her artifact. Necromancy seemed extremely widespread in White Arden, as if the forest itself were trapped between this world and the hereafter. Your proximity to the hereafter gate triggered more memories. The expedition fled the city after the jailbreak, reached the birthplace of the world, and inherited fantastic powers. Iana, who'd become the goddess Nui, worried they held too much power. She watched as former friends, now gods and heroes, began to war with each other. To her horror, the entire continent was drawn into the conflict. Many thousands died. She rallied with some of her former friends and vowed to save as many lives as possible. They would seal away Jean, who would become Kyrios, the rampaging god of destruction. While Nui opened a portal to the hereafter, the citizens of Auroria could then pass through it and exit the afterworld to a new land, untouched by war. The portal they'd exited through was the Hereafter Gate in White Arden. The Gate Nui's chosen had sworn to guard. The Blood Hands had been the real enemies all along. Atalantia's former students had interpreted her teachings incorrectly and grown overly zealous. Because Nui was the goddess of the hereafter, they became obsessed with death and necromancy. They came to despise all other Nuyans for not sharing their beliefs and not worshipping Nui the right way, with dark and bloody rituals. Though Atalantia was frustrated and angry, she was too old to rejoin Nui's chosen. They were Auroria's most elite soldiers. As Nui allowed for the exodus from Auroria, these warriors volunteered to stay behind. They pledged to keep enemy forces from following their comrades and destroying their new lives. The hereafter prevented them from aging, and the pledge became an eternal duty. By the time you reached her, Marion was already dead. Malcolm stood over her, gripping a blade, surrounded by other bloodhounds. But you'd watched Malcolm die at your hand. He'd been buried. How was he here? Laughing, he said Sloane was an old fool who worshipped a statue instead of Nui. And Nui's chosen were ineffectual idiots who'd failed to secure victory after centuries. Clearly, he'd never shared in Iana's memories, or he'd have seen how noble the Nui's chosen were. Nui had known them only briefly, but had the utmost respect for them. For the good of everyone, they'd sworn to fight Anthalon for eternity. But Malcolm said it was time for a new breed of hero, the Bloodhounds, and he would lead them. All they needed was the Ring of Nui. Rage welled up inside you, and you threw yourself at Malcolm. Surprised, he dropped the ring. The blood hands were everywhere, attacking you from every angle. But you had eyes only for Malcolm. He'd slain Merian and Sloane, and slandered all the noble Nui's chosen. You would avenge them all or die trying. If Malcolm refused to die, you'd keep killing him again and again. Eventually, you'd make it stick. A crack of thunder tore through your ears as you defeated him. Lightning snaked across the ceiling. You turned to find the rest of the blood hands dead, and a strange man standing before you. In his hand, he held not a sword, a staff, or a lute, but a flickering bolt of lightning. It had to be Lucius. Grief crumbled his gentle features as he gazed down at Merian's body.
Lucius slipped the Ring of Nui back onto his finger. You recognized the simple band immediately from Iana's memories. Lucius thanked you for helping him, but you gestured to Marion. She'd wanted to help him, not you. To reward her devotion, if he was such an almighty god, he needed to bring her back to life. Lucius offered a regretful smile and murmured that he didn't have that kind of power. He was no god and didn't want to be. He was only a hero who had once made a vow to his beloved. It was true that while everyone knew Nui's name, no one called Lucius a god. But then why had Merian wasted so much breath on him? Maybe Malcolm had been right. Maybe Nui's chosen were just ineffectual fools. Lucius laughed. He said there was no need to grieve and no need to hurry. He might be powerless, but he did know someone who could help. He leveled a finger at you. Lucius explained that the magic contained within the Golden Runes was a pure magic. Unlike necromancy, it wouldn't taint or twist the soul of the person being resurrected. Years ago, Anthalon had faked his own death and pulled back his troops. Thinking the war was finally over, Nui's Chosen left the hereafter and re-entered normal life. They arrived on New Year, started families, and took up new careers. Finally having the chance to share in what they'd spent so long protecting. Just when their last ounces of fear were replaced by the bliss of life, Anthalon attacked. His forces were fiercer and more deadly than ever. The risk of his breaking through the gate had never been greater. Nui's chosen were forced to abandon their new lives and return to the war. But before leaving, they gave their children a special mark to protect them, a golden rune. You were an heir of the noblest lineage ever to tread the earth. Lucius said the rune was read as Kaidella, which meant love in an ancient language called Ipnish. Back then, drawing the character with your finger had been the equivalent of saying, I love you. Nui's Chosen had picked this symbol to give their offspring. Drawing the magic from their own life forces, Nui's Chosen traced the rune on each child. Their children were marked with a love so strong it could be concentrated into physical form. Malcolm had used his mark on himself. The ultimate selfishness, the ultimate cowardice. Poor Malcolm. He hadn't wasted his death or even his life. He'd wasted love itself. Some Nuyans had been fearful of the special magic the heirs held and kept the truth a secret. Even people like Marion who knew the heirs were special, could never figure out exactly how. Marion, a good and loyal friend, the golden rune on your arm began to glow brighter and brighter. As its light flared up, your eyes widened. Marion drew a breath. The golden mark vanished from your arm, never to return. Marion awoke with a musical laugh. Your suspicions about her heritage had been correct. She was one of the noble Marians, betrothed to the prince himself. She already knew that as queen, she wanted to lead people back to their rightful place on Auroria. She had suspected the magic of the rune bearers could help. That was why, against Atalantia's advice, she had gone to find them. Lucius returned to the battle he'd been fighting for centuries. Nui's Chosen finally understood that their sacrifice was total. Even if the war seemed to end, they could never return to their people. 
it was too risky. But despite Anthelon, his evil, his destruction, the people they were protecting could return to Auroria, could reclaim the ancient Nuyen lands, the birthlands of Lucius and Iana, and your parents. You felt another of Iana's memories emerge. As the goddess Nui, she just transported the citizens of Auroria to their new home. But the effort was too great, and she was fading away. She implored Lucius to be the people's father, to take care of them. He agreed, promising he wouldn't let them forget their mother's name. You no longer had your golden rune, but you had used it well. And now, you had something even better, a legacy.